out where the emergency exits are. Um, if there's any emergency, there's an emergency exit behind you. All three of these doors have fire alarms right there if somebody needs to pull it. Um, restrooms are out the door to the left. All of our restrooms are gender neutral here at the center. Um, so use whichever restroom um, works best for you. Um, otherwise, um, we want to welcome you. Thank you for joining us. Um, the next person up to speak to welcome you is Josh Grieser from the U.S. Department of State. Come on up, Josh. Ambassador Randy Berry. 
The day the group arrived into Washington, D.C., nearly three weeks ago, news broke about the senseless tragedy in Orlando. This terrible event reminded us that despite strides that we have made in addressing violence against the LGBTI community, we still have a long way to go. But we must remain hopeful. We must remain optimistic, as demonstrated by the international visitors who attended a vigil that evening to show their unity, support, and love to those affected by this terrible tragedy. As Secretary Kerry stated at a Pride event last week, the fight is not yet won, but we should never ever forget the distance that we have traveled. We should never forget that what makes America different from almost every other nation is not a common bloodline, or a common religion, or a common ideology, or even a common heritage. What makes us different is that we are united by an uncommon idea. The idea that we are all created equal and we are all endowed with inalienable, that's a tough one, inalienable rights. That's what defines America. Now programs like the IVLP aim to foster mutual understanding, advance social justice, and guide dialogue on key foreign policy priorities such as LGBTI rights. And now, I welcome the panel to share some of their vignettes from their IVLP experience and the inspiring work that they do in their home countries. Thank you. Except I'm shorter than Alaska. <laughs> Can I get a hey girl? Hey girl! <laughs> That's better, thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you for attending this evening. My name is Fernando Lopez and I'm the director of operations at San Diego Pride. Which, by the way, is uh, in just 16 days. No pressure. <laughs> And I understand that many people think that what once started as a riot, um, people believe has turned into nothing more than a party. And I'm here today because that is definitely not the case in San Diego. With so much more, as we do advocacy programs, civic engagement, educational programs, and youth programs all year round. In 1983, San Diego Pride organizer and board member by the name of Doug Moore helped to found the Inner Pride organization that links together global pride efforts, where pride here in San Diego is a little different than pride in New York. Just think about the differences that pride in Uganda, which can mean a death sentence, is different from pride in Russia, that means a prison sentence. Our mission in San Diego Pride is to foster pride in and respect for all lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender communities locally, nationally, and globally. We honor that commitment with our continued efforts through Interpride and partnerships like this with the State Department, the Diplomacy Council, that in the last four years has brought together 241 delegates from 99 countries around the world to the doorstep of San Diego Pride. In fact, just this morning, I flew back from um, a meeting with the Department of State in Juarez, Mexico, where I met with Mexican government officials and LGBT activists from all over Mexico. This is the work that we do at San Diego Pride. Now, without further ado, actually, let's see. I'm going to try this, so let's see if it works. Wish me luck. Today we have visitors from Cabo Verde, the Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, Cote Verde, uh, Ghana, Guyana, Haiti, Italy, uh, <coughs> India, Kazakhstan, Mexico, Mozambique, Nepal, Nigeria, Palestinian territories, Poland, Republic of Korea, Rwanda, Slovakia, South Korea, Taiwan, United Republic of Tanzania, Turkey, and Uganda. I will uh, now let each of the panelists introduce themselves. Now each panelist will have two minutes to answer each question, including the introduction. There are cards at the front to help them know when it's time. Um, as we go through those questions, realize that at the end of this, your job here today is to be citizen diplomats. Meet them afterwards, engage with them, get to know them, make those connections so you too can help change the world. And let's start. Hello. Hello. 
Uh, good uh, afternoon, everyone. Uh, I am Neelu and I'm from Nepal. I am a filmmaker by profession, uh, and uh, I am also the only out uh, lesbian or homosexual uh, filmmaker in Nepal, so I'm the first one there. Um, well, basically, uh, what uh, I'd like to do is uh, educate uh, and make people aware of LGBTI issues through cinema and arts. So that's me. My name is Christian Daruka, so I come from Rwanda, I'm a human rights lawyer. I've been uh, in this uh, struggle for the last 11 years. As a human rights lawyer, as I've represented members from the LGBT communities, as well as through providing pro bono legal services. My motto is, I want to see a world whereby everyone is given a chance as a human being. Because from the audience and all of my panelists my panel here, we all share one thing, one value, human dignity. That's all I keep telling people. Human dignity should not have any color, any whatever. Just we are human beings. That's all my message I give to everyone. Wherever I do my work on daily basis. Hi, my name is Harish, Harish Iyer. That almost sounded like James Bond. <laughs> And uh, I'm from India. Um, I work for a number of social causes, um, child sexual abuse, animal welfare, and, uh, and I personally believe that every cause is important, as important as the LGBT cause. And uh, I, I'm here to represent the intersectionality of issues. Um, and, and, I, and I think that we as a whole, uh, a person as a whole, um, also happens to be, he happens to be gay, but he also happens to be uh, belonging to a family, uh, living in a society, uh, he needs, he has a religion, he has a place. So, so there are many layers to my, uh, to each one of us, this thing, and I think that intersectionality, and to understand that intersectionality is important, and uh, every, uh, every aspect of one person's life, not just, not just being gay, but a lot, lot many other things are also important when, when it comes to uh, recognizing a person. Thank you. Hi. Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Miss Leticia. As you can see here, you can actually call me Miss You. We do a lot of special programs and awareness on the HIV AIDS. And also we do more trainings on human rights defenders. And then of course we do more capacity building. For now, and later you can get more. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Hugo Villegas, I'm from Mexico. I have uh, two part-time jobs at the day job. I work at the City Hall of Colima, which uh, gives me the opportunity to <clears throat> involve uh, the mayor in some LGBT actions. And uh, the gay job, it's going to way, uh, I come representing an NGO which is called CDC. We started working in 2006, uh, and right now uh, we have done a, a lot of, of, of job field jobs, um, especially in sexual rights, promoting sexual rights, sexual education. <clears throat> Right, we're working also with the Ministry of Education to get some scholarships for our people. Uh, also, we work with the healthcare systems because we need to attend a public <coughs> situation of HIV/AIDS. 
and it's not uh, only for the straight people, it is also for gay people. <clears throat> That's all. Hi everyone, my name is Mattia and I come from Italy. Um, I'm part of an association uh, that is called Archie Gay and it's one of the oldest associations in, uh, in my country and we advocate for LGBT people. I'd like you to, to understand uh, my country and uh, um, to feel the way we feel every day. And to do that, I need to tell you that my country is made of 60 million people and it's the only country which surrounds completely another country. In that other country, it's a small state, the smallest state in the world, but one of the richest and one of the most powerful and one with the highest concentration of gay men in that country. <laughs> What is being done in your country to support the visibility, safety, and health of people who are transgender? I would say nothing much has been done in terms of uh, supporting uh, LGBT uh, transgender people in Rwanda because right now the focus just in imagining, uh, which is the issue which is imagining right now is uh, only gay, the gay issues, and uh, the only area of intervention is the fight against HIV in Rwanda, whereby. Most of the gay are just associated with men having sex. That's the only window of opportunities. I would say nothing much has been done for transgender in terms of visibility. The law does not criminalize same-sex relationship, but still people cannot come out and say their gender identity is still very difficult for the society in general to accept differences in terms of gender identity. Um, in my country, in fact, uh, there's something positive in, within the LGBT IQ movement. The T has, uh, had, we have some positive legislation over there. Uh, they're given, uh, they, they're given reservation in uh, in colleges, educational institutions. But uh, but there is also a flip side to it. The flip side is the fact that they could do everything but not have sex because we have section 377 which criminalizes sex against the order of nature. That means that a transgender person gets benefits of uh, uh, preferential, uh, in, in preference in educational bodies and stuff but if the person has sex he can go to jail for over a lifetime and uh, because that the law doesn't discriminate, even if it's a straight man. Technically, Section 377 is so funny that even if it's a straight man having sex with his wife and he has any kind of sex which is not pino vagina, the man can go to jail. Okay, and not only that, even if you use an artificial orifice which could be your hand for having sex, you could go to jail for life. So basically, so technically, that's the interpretation. Yeah, I think to me, I'll give you two, two ways. It's a two-way traffic. One of them, I think, and there has been a great change in my country, as far as you all know, Uganda, that we worked very hard to make sure that working together with the international community to bring down this law, which is called Kill the Day Law. I think this is very tremendous work we have done so far. And actually, through that, we have seen ourselves visible out there. We are visible that they know that we have statistics, we have the gay, lesbian, transgender, and Q, and Q, and Q, and Q. That's one thing. On the other hand, we have also done within this to make sure that we continue to fight, building allies within our systems, within the movement, who are actually collaborating, working together with us. I'm talking about working with the feminist movement, which are in position now to support us to drive our agenda in the way we want. The other thing is we also able to run it to make sure that we, we build what we call a national security committee within us, the movement, within us, the LGBT community. In this capacity, this committee is actually in position to move around if there is a case, they'll be the one running around 
doing a lot of litigation because in any way you need documentation at the end of the day. However, we still have a problem that the trans community still facing between arrests, they are the most targeted people within the community because they are visible. Anyone can see. They suffer in public transportation system. They cannot board in public transport system in any way. They are being evicted every now and then. They are becoming prostitutes of housing states and so forth and so on. In this case, Aluja continues. We will not sit back. We are continuing fighting and joining us to fight this battle. Okay, um, I forgot to tell you from where I come from, it's a very small state, uh, it's Colima, it's three hours so to Guadalajara, so it's not a progressive state or city like Mexico City or Guadalajara City, which they have a progressive policy for trans, trans people. That means that they can have access to the healthcare system to get hormones, to get uh, this sexual assignment surgery. And in my case, it is mostly controlled by a conservatory group, which is called religion or political. So the, the, the first thing that we have done recently, we sit down with uh, the governor, we sit down with the chief of, of policemen, and we capacitate them. We gave them a course to sensibilize the LGBT situation, and especially the, L, the transgender situation. Because transgender at Colima, they usually are beaten up. They usually are arrested. Why? Because they're different. Because they're visible. So uh, the, the first step we have done is to see that protocol of how the police should uh, act in case they arrest or arrest someone only because he's transgender. So we can uh, grab their safety during uh, the time she's being arrested because. Uh, you know, Mexico is quite uh, corrupt and uh, we have this macho culture. So, usually uh, the trans also get a sexual harassment from authority, from the police. So, with this protocol, we try to ensure they, they are safe. That's what we have done and when I come back, we are going to work on, on the trans agenda. That means we, we are planning to sue the state, the Congress and the governor to change the laws and to provide them more rights to the trans people. Thank you. Okay, I'm sorry for reading, but I'm really scared and I forget a few things that are very important in my, about my country. In 1982, Italy became the third nation in the world to recognize the right for transgender people to align, okay? The law on transsexualism prescribed that when a transgender person is married to another person, the couple should divorce. But the Supreme Court of our country uh, just established probably last year that that is no longer needed, okay? In 2006, we had the first transgender MP. And uh, last year, and last year, uh, Italy became the fifth country in the world to acknowledge that trans people are allowed to identify as trans without medical surgery or genital intervention. Wow. <laughs> Nevertheless, being a trans person in my country is still very difficult. We still experiment a lot of stigma, and I think it's very awful sometimes. In my organization, we have a lot of uh, young transgender, transgenders, and um, in the city where I live is the city with the highest concentrations of transgender people in the region. Okay, but it's very difficult for us to approach them, to involve them in our activities, and uh, this is there's still a lot of work to do and to involve them in our. Um, in Nepal, like in many cases, um, a lot of LGBT movement started because of the visibility of transgender people, uh, just like uh, Stonewall. Um, so, uh, because transgender are people who are most visible in the society in terms of appearance, 
So uh, there are certain laws uh, in my country that do protect uh, transgender, that, that are made for uh, transgender safety. Uh, I think uh, we are the first country in Asia, uh, um, the first country in Asia to have a third gender on our passport and citizenship. Um, so I think, yeah. But on the flip side, having said that, we uh, I think from a couple of years, uh, the first. Uh, Third gender was issued in 2012, and so far we only have 25 passports that have been issued as uh, transgender passports that have been uh, issued. So I think that speaks volumes for itself as to how um, how reserved we are when it comes to talking about issues, whether it's transgender or LGBT, IQ, uh, whatever we name it, because a lot of things start because of the confusion with these terms. We're not clear about what they mean. So that is why we have a lot of issues uh, although the government in many ways seems a little bit forward than the society itself because we have laws protecting them, but the society is yet to accept transgenders in our, in our society, forget the community. So that is one thing. And when it comes to um, health of transgender people, we are a country where we don't talk about sex at all. So you can just imagine if a straight person goes to a gynecologist, um, you, you hardly get to talk about anything. So with, when it comes to transgender health, I think there's nothing being done because people just don't talk about it. And uh, more than that, uh, a lot of transgenders do feel that it's more than a health issue. It is going to be about how they're going to humiliate them or talk down to them if they go if, uh, with health issues to any health, um, uh, any health department. So that is the situation of transgender in my community right now. Thank you. We're going to start with India. And if we could still um, actually have everyone say the name and the country that they're from so everyone can hear. Um, what role, uh, what leadership roles do women play in the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, intersex questioning, asexual, allied movement in your country? And how does chauvinism and the oppression of women affect the LGBTQ movement? Um, I'm Harish from India. And uh, women, I mean, women play uh, a very important role. Uh, but but yes, there is a lot of uh, chauvinism in India, uh, as in any part of the world. Okay, so it's uh, usually India. Um, you draw a context with India because of all the rape and everything that makes headlines. Um, but but in reality. Oh, when I visit other countries and when I meet other people, uh, I, I find us on an equal plane. There is chauvinism everywhere. Uh, there is male chauvinism everywhere. Um, women uh, go through a double stigmatization. One, because of their gender. Second, because of the chauvinism which already... Uh, second, because they happen to be from the LGBT community. So, um, they do find it difficult, but I have to highlight that there are a lot of emerging voices in India of women who are coming out and who are speaking out loud uh, against, uh, against this. Um, I, would, I would highly recommend that you go through this website, which is started by a group of lesbians. It's called acfamily.com, uh, which, is, which is one brilliant case study by itself about how lesbians and bisexual women have led the struggle. Uh, so it's extremely important that our, and, and we make an attempt every time that when we are speaking about LGBTIQ, it's well represented by women. And, uh, and the fact that, uh, that all causes of women don't become uh, the dying voice in, and it doesn't become a cisgender male gay man uh, <coughs> issue. So we make that attempt every time, and uh, and, and yeah, and and I would all uh, recommend you recommend KCFamily.com. You should go and watch it. Yeah, Leticia from Uganda again, but I have a little bit of cold, so don't mind about my voice. I, I think in Uganda, I think um, like I said, the women's movement is actually has played a very big role. You know, we started working as single community, but what we did, we had to identify the feminist movement, and this is a very interesting part of it. So, we, the women, started working with women who are working as feminist organizations. 
And in that case, when the wind feminist movement make a lot of noise, our voices were heard. When the law was brought in parliament, they were the first ones to come and join us to work together. So we went and worked as women, because we looked at ourselves also as women. The gay community is marginalized as the, same as, as, as the women's movement in Uganda is marginalized. Because in Uganda, a woman is believed to be, her role is from the bedroom to the kitchen and from the kitchen to the bedroom. And in this case, we all refused and say, let's work together as a team, as a feminist. We worked together and we are still working together. Although there are still challenges because women have not been provided a platform. This is what we are looking for. We have to find a platform where we can talk, where we can speak. This is still a long way. A woman's movement still undergoes a lot of difficulties in terms of agenda, like my colleague has said. Recently, our speaker, our speaker in Uganda, in the Ugandan parliament, is a woman. But because of the force, and because of the agenda the government gives, the law has to be passed because they push the woman at the corner. So in this case, we still have many difficulties within the feminist movement, within us working as women, like me, I'm a woman. We still have a lot to do. Thank you. Okay, it's a very hard question. And uh, I don't want to be misunderstood. Uh, the leadership uh, that we play to LGBT is very hard in Mexico. We hardly, hard, hardly have a leader in these cases because women suffer much more discrimination. Uh, I'm, I make a list of what will happen if you're a woman and you're trying to work uh, on these kind of issues. Yeah, the, the first uh, discrimination they suffer because Mexi Mexico, we have this much culture, is because of gender. They're women. So in that social context, somehow you're less than a man. The second, by your age, how old are you? Okay, you're a woman. How old are you? The third one, sexual orientation. So you have three, three kind of discriminations. By your gender, your age, and your sexual orientation. If you're a lesbian, if you're a bisexual, if you're straight, or something. The next one is ethnicity. Because Mexico is very plural, and everyone, most of them, they think that they're John Smith and came here to this land. But we have uh, some native cultures, so like Oaxaca, Guerrero, um, Chiapas. And if you are part of those communities which also suffer discrimination, the, the women in there, they don't have an equal access for healthcare systems. When they are pregnant and they are going to do the labor, sometimes they do it in the backyard hospital because they have a triple for discrimination. The last one, the social, sorry, not the last one, social status. If you're rich, if you're poor, it also matters to discriminate against you. The physical issue, the physical aspect, if you're fat, if you're thin, if you're tall, if you're small, and that's all. So it's very difficult for a woman to stand because they have to go on that progress of discrimination. Even for the men, the female, or uh, between themselves. So it's very hard to find. We have few, especially trans, but few. That's all, thank you. Okay, talking about Italy, um, you need to know that only in 1975, the law 151 provided for gender equality within marriage, abolishing the legal dominance of the husband. In my country, it's very difficult to be a woman. My country is difficult to see um, women as managers, uh, or in my country, women gain less money than men at work. Okay? We have a prime minister called Berlusconi who became famous worldly because all he was doing was having a party with these young girls. Because unfortunately, in my society, for many people, being a woman is still degrading. But at the same time, we need, to, we need to say that in my country it's difficult to be any kind of minority. It's life is easier for you when you are a white Christian man. 
Or if you're a woman, if you're gay, if you're black, uh, or if you belong to other minorities, it's still very difficult. Okay? Uh, I'm, I'm very proud of the fact that the LGBT community is pushing to change things in my country. We have a very important association, organization, which is called Rainbow Families, which is, a, which is an organization that gathers all the uh, LGBT families with kids. And the president of this organization is a woman, okay? And she's doing a lot to change things where I live. Hi, Nino from Nepal. Um, uh, well, in my country, women are already a minority. So there are very few women who will actually openly talk about LGBTQ issues, obviously. I come from the film industry, cinema and arts, but imagine if I am the only out homosexual in my country, the state of lesbians and LGBT people, um, just the visibility is so low. So there are of course women uh, who do uh, work for uh, LGBTQ issues and uh, lesbian issues, but we are definitely overshadowed by transgender and gay men and, and their issues for us. And I think uh, it's important that more women come out and speak about it. And also, uh, I think right now, although women are part of the movement, we are only part of the movement. We are not leading the movement right now. So uh, there is still a long way to go uh, because we are, uh, even I think even in the LGBTQ society, being marginalized because we are women in it. So that is the state uh, in my country right now. Hi, it's Christian from Rwanda. Uh, Rwanda's situation is quite complex. Uh, Rwanda has the highest number of uh, female MPs in the world. And when you look at it, you think probably they have done a very, very good job in terms of numbers. Numbers of female MPs, senators, and some positions as well. But when it comes to the LGBT movement, now there's a disparity now on the ground. So far, the LGBT, LGBTQ movement has been led by gay men. One of the reasons could be was in 2009, when there was the government of Rwanda was reviewing the penal code. It was the first time they were trying to criminalize same-sex relationship, but they were only targeting men. That's when the first time people came out and said this was wrong. And also, it was also from the public health perspective, as the Minister of Health, they have acknowledged that criminalizing men having sex with men will be counterproductive and to the HIV response. But so far, I've seen a couple of women advocating for their women, women rights in general. But when it comes to lesbian, as well as transgenders, some, I would say, they are not probably aware of those issues. I'll have to take some part of responsibility because I keep telling some of my human rights activist fellows, we have the duty to convince those polit politicians, decision makers. They don't have any duty on to, to make any effort to understand what we're saying, but we have to persuade and convince them, not the other way around. I think we still have a long way to go, but I'm optimistic that we, we shall reach the point one day. Thank you. We're going to start with uh, Uganda. What international immigration reform, refugee, asylum, or embargo policies changes would you feel that would be most beneficial to your country's role in the global LGBT movement? What international immigration reform, refugee, asylum, or embargo policy changes do you feel would be most beneficial to your country's role in the global LGBT movement? Yeah, I think it's quite a bit com complex question, but I will try my best. You have two minutes to save the world. Yeah. <laughs> Good luck. Yeah, I, I think when it comes to, in terms of migration and also in terms of policies and all these kind of things to refugees or asylum seekers is something what is a bit complex apparently and everybody is discussing about this across the globe. This is not just happening just because people want to do it or what, but this is a situation. 
I think to some extent, um, a, a, yeah, there are some kind of reforms which are actually been put in place. I'm, I'm giving example of when Germany is pushing the immigrants and then Sweden is also blocking the roads, which, which has not been the case. Uh, considering the, the issue in terms of the, um, the Schengen, it's when you have a visa. And it, it, not until unless people had to make a lot of noise and say they think this is not working well and then they had to come down and sit and say okay we will take five thousand or we will take twenty thousand i think that was a good thing in the beginning however it's not actually solving the problem according to me because you see within this a lot of people are also taking advantage over the system you know people think that i have my money i can buy a ticket i will go and just use the name lgbti which is a big, big problem right now. I don't know how we can address this. We really need to sit down and think and have a strategy and see a way forward in this. The other thing is I would like to say is probably is um, it has been quite okay, especially for the good reason for those who actually really felt that their lives are in danger and they were given a Z asylum, probably in countries like Germany, or in countries like Denmark, probably uh, in countries like Holland, uh, they did not suffer quite much, but it's still a big problem that people still want to measure you for you to prove to them that you're gay. And then they will ask you some silly questions, like, when did you know your sex? Okay, um, in the particular case of Mexico, we have a constitutional level of grant to no discrimination policy and the men and women are equal. But in reality, it's a, a little bit hard. So I think uh, to improve, we, we need to make some anti-bullying uh, policies to create. Uh, our state is working on, on, on those anti-bullying um, policies but not only to be uh, their stand, we have to apply them. We also, uh, I think we, we, we need to, to improve the right to access a decent job and to have a job. Because LGBT members are discriminated because of how they look, of how they are, of what is uh, their gender identities or sexual orientation, and you cannot get a job. And we also think uh, we, we need uh, to also work with full, full access to health care system. Even for the people uh, who is part of the LGBT community or the people who are not part of the LGBT community as straight people. Uh, in the particular case, uh, we work with HIV patients. And if they have another condition or another symptomatic uh, sickness or illness, they are refused to the medical system. Why? We are not going to spend medicine on you. You are already dead. You got AIDS. Why should we uh, waste this medicine if you are dead? And also creating uh, safe, safe places like youth, youth shelters. I think uh, that's uh, what we can improve and we can take it from you. Thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to clear, um, I believe you were answering the youth question. Um, this question is in regards to immigration reform, refugee, asylum, embargo policies. But don't worry, it's your two minutes. There's lots of stuff. Okay. Okay. Uh, the European Court uh, two years ago ruled that gays are eligible for asylum if they can demonstrate persecution. And this thing actually allowed uh, a few countries in Europe to ask uh, gay people and, lesbian, uh, and lesbians to demonstrate uh, this persecution in uh, very humiliating ways. Okay? Um, we have a, a huge immigration at this moment in, uh, in, in Europe. Okay? A lot of people coming from Syria, uh, but especially from Africa. So I think the best thing to do is uh, to make things better back there, okay, in, in Africa, for instance. So we should stop uh, religious preachers to go to those countries and really uh, make life really hard for LGBT people right there, okay?
fail and to stop the persecution of LGBTs in, in that continent. Um, I can see through my organization we have a lot of uh, LGBTs uh, asking for uh, asylum, asylum seekers, but at the same time it's very hard to, to convince them to come out. They need to come out, but the fear is that if they come out in our country, their families could be persecuted uh, back to the country where they come from. So it's a difficult situation, it's very hard to handle. Um, we need more support from the authorities of the, the by the European Parliament because a single state cannot make a difference with such a big issue. Thank you. <coughs> um, well, I think uh, Nepal is already um, setting an example by being uh, by issuing third gender passports. Uh, but also, if you see the number of passports that have been issued until now, uh, there are just 25 in, uh, in the past six, uh, four or five years, I think, uh, only 25 passports have been issued. And the main issue with that is because when they go to this ministry to go uh, to have their passport issued, they are actually faced with a lot of humiliation. People don't want to talk to them. They don't want to talk about uh, uh, transgender issues. They don't want to talk about LGBT issues, they don't want to know them, they don't want to know that they exist. That is one of the biggest problems. So as I said earlier, even though, even though the law in our country has come a bit forward, the society is yet to come forward and embrace the law. So I think one of the main problems with that is because um, the government uh, has to be aware that, these, uh, that our community exists and they have to train the trainers and show them uh, and make them aware of the fact that uh, we are part of the community and we are important. And there should be policies that are going to safeguard um, our, like that, that are going to keep us safe. Uh, and well, like we need to be, um, how do you say? Uh, we need to be more visible out there so that they know that we exist. So I think uh, like inclusiveness in politics and um, just, I think, education that are going to train these trainers are going to help. Yeah, Christian from Rwanda again. From the Rwandan perspective, I would say that based on the history of Rwanda, political history of Rwanda, we should expect Rwanda to be opening its borders to anyone fleeing his or her country from persecution or based on his sexual orientation. Because Rwanda has a tragic history of the genocide where people were just killed on their ethnic belonging, origin. That should have been the starting point. Rwanda has experienced it and besides genocide, many Rwandans have lived in exile fleeing persecutions. I would expect Rwanda to be more open, to, to lead the way in Africa. However, the law, the current legal framework, it's quite problematic. As it sets one of the ground for someone to be granted asylum in Rwanda, it's worth to make sure that the person does not pose a threat to good morals. How do we define morality? That's the one million question I can ask. And then it creates a very, very vacuum. And also this could lead to the broad interpretation of what is morality by the immigration officers. I think the best way to go would be a legal reform and policy reform to make sure that this ground for morality is removed. So whoever comes in Rwanda claiming for applying for asylum, because he has been persecuted based on sexual orientation, he should be welcome to Rwanda to make sure also that even if the country the person has been fleeing from wants that person back, Rwanda should desist from sending him back to his country. I think that should be the strong message we need to send out to the government of Rwanda. Um, I'm Harish from India. Um, Recently we had, I mean, there are a lot of countries which are facing a lot of threat 
For instance, recently in my neighboring country, uh, Bangladesh, we had someone by the name of Zulas who was hacked to death. And, uh, and there are activists all across the world. I mean, if you thought that America is a safer place, the day we landed over here, it is safer in terms of people. Um, people and policies, I've never seen a more rainbow-friendly country ever in my life. Uh, so, your country is a beautiful country, but, but a hate crime can happen anywhere. Um, so, what's, what's more important is, uh, is awareness and strengthening uh, the laws in that country itself. As much as asylum seekers, it's important. And even when we speak about asylum, uh, what's, what's extremely important is the fact that there needs to be education within the country so that asylum seekers are welcome and, uh, and also amongst asylum seekers so that they are grateful for the fact that uh, there is another country which has actually offered them uh, space to live in and, uh, and they are grateful so that it doesn't become a threat to the indigenous population that's living over there. Uh, I'm not saying that they're threatful or anything of that kind, I'm just saying that, that there needs to be education enough to ensure that both the parties don't take it for granted. And, uh, and, 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 I, and I guess that's something that's, that's needed so that uh, any person who's welcome to a new country also understand that he, ha he or she also has that responsibility. So we're going to have one final question, so that way we can get them to mix and mingle with all of you. What one thing would you tell the people in this room today, and in this country, to help the LGBT movement in your country, and what one message do you want these folks to leave here with today? No pressure. I want to thank you all. I want to thank this, this country, the district, the district, and all the persons we have met because they give us the strength to continue to go back to our countries to make a difference. And uh, I think that uh, the countries that <clears throat> are like first world, I believe this is a first world country, they need to support the other countries which are um, ways of development to become a first world countries. How you can help us. And I, I've been saying this during all of these meetings, how you can help us. We can work, that, that's working. If something happens in our country, we will make social pressure. But we also need media pressure. And how can you make it happen? If some other country start to comment and to make a statement and fingering and pointing, what is happening in Mexico, what is happening in Uganda, why are they killing? In Mexico, we had a situation like Orlando, two weeks before Orlando, but in Mexico, they don't speak at all. So we want and we need your support in that way, or every way is possible. Thank you, and thank you for giving us the strength to come back and continue the fighting for our rights. Thank you. This is my second time in this beautiful country. My first time was about 10 years ago. And coming back now, uh, I can see uh, big changes were being done, okay? And um, I remember when last year, your Supreme Court ruled that gay marriage world is uh, recognized for the, the country, okay? It, it needs a little bit cheer for that. It was uh, a huge sign, okay? Of, uh, of the fact that things can change. And uh, in fact, uh, civil unions were approved in Italy on May 11th of this year. Okay, so. <laughs> and maybe you remember that two, three years ago, there was a scandal made by one of the Barilla Pasta owners, managers, okay, when he said that there's one only there's only one type of family and that, that company would not represent gay families in their advertisement. <coughs> and there was a huge response uh, in America and much bigger than the one we had in our country. And it was thanks to the reaction that was here that 
Bermuda changed the policy completely. Okay? So I want to say thanks for that. And I hope that your community will always be there for us when we need okay? Because you provide us with inspiration, you provide us with uh, a lot of good examples on how things can be can be changed. So once again, thank you for being here. I think America is very influential, especially in my country. Um, whenever America speaks, people do listen in my country. So I think um, it, it's, it, it's great to be here and to be able to talk about LGBTQ issues and be, to be able to share some of the experiences in Nepal and exchange them with people over here. Um, but also having said that, uh, America and Nepal have good international ties and I think that it's time that um, uh, it's time that we come together and, and work towards uh, making this LGBTQ community in Nepal visible. And I think one of the biggest things, um, and no matter how much we try to deny it, is funding. Uh, and a lot of funding is required when we want people to be visible and when, because funding pulls people and they are willing to talk about it. Because I think we cannot fight a movement on empty stomach. You know, it is important that people are um, talking about it and are getting paid to talk about it so that there is a reason and there is a, at least there is a purpose and there is a drive behind talking about it. We are already a very poor nation. We have, like, economically, we are very poor. And imagine in a country like that, to talk about these issues and to feel the threat of people and to be on empty stomachs while doing it, it's just not happening. So I think a lot of funding is required in my country when we talk about LGBTQ issues. From what we have seen and what we have had during our last three weeks here, there is no dispute that we have come from a very, very long journey. We have made progress. We want to share the progress with you. I will ask two things. First one, some of evangelical churches, American evangelical churches, they are fueling homophobia in our African countries. What we are expecting from you is that Please help us try to educate some of the American people who, who contribute through donations to those churches because they are taking their money in Africa, building churches. And I know, I'm sure none of you probably give donations to them, but our neighbors, your neighbors, relatives, colleagues, make sure that they stop giving donations to those churches which are fueling homophobia. That's one. The second humble request. I know how powerful you are in your country. How you've been able to make sure that those multinationals here, they have been included, being inclusive with L LGBTQ. And I have no, no doubt how powerful they are. They have been investing in many countries, not only Africa, across Asia, Latin America. They have the same. Please, please try to persuade them that what they are doing in America, they also take it overseas. To make sure that LGBTQ inclusiveness in America is also a reality in those countries where they are investing a lot of money. Because it's the, it will be an irony if someone here who has been getting some benefits from partnership. If he has to go to work overseas in countries which do not recognize same-sex marriage like in Rwanda, he will lose, he will lose that kind of benefits. What would be the point of him getting promotion in a multinational company? It's beneficial for prof, the individual from his professional perspective, and also being told equality is good for business. Just the two requests, thank you very much. My name is Harish, and before I begin, a um, um, big thank you to Josh, to Brittany, Bonnie, Leo for bringing us over here and having this wonderful program. And 
to, for the Department of State and everyone, everyone present in this room. Thank you very much for having us here. Um, I, uh, to add to his point, we need to move to a one world, one policy kind of a view. And homophobia should not be uh, a part of that corporate view. So when you, have, when you kind of do business in our country, the benefits that your countrymen get is are the benefits that our countrymen should also get. And so should your employees who come from your country and work in our countries. So I think that will solve a lot of issues. And I, I have to say that we might not have the whole world with us, but we have us with us. And that should make a lot of difference because we really might look for help from outside. But in the end, we just have us for us. And uh, that's, that's something that we need to live with. We all are able, we all are disabled in our own ways, in various forms. And if we cannot put our abilities, put each other's abilities to solve our disabilities and our challenges, then we are doing a great disservice to humanity. And we just have us for us. We have to help each other. Thank you. They have stolen my points. <laughs> great, we're done. So that's the one. Yeah, I want some America. <laughs> Americans, you are all wonderful people. I'm in love with you guys, except one person. <laughs> I would like you in this room to send one single message to Scott Live. You are, are you aware of him? The American evangelist? Oh, yes. Scott Live, who came to Uganda to start preaching hatred. No, it's Scott Life. It's one of those big Americans. He came to Uganda. This issue of homosexuality was never talked in my country. But when he came to Uganda, he held a press conference. That is where it all started from. And they are the ones who are fueling it. They are the ones who sponsor these pastors to come to America. Send the message, he should stop. Time has come, he has to stop. I would ask the government of the United States to buy him, if possible, from crossing the borders. <laughs> if possible. The other thing I would like to know is, I mean I would like to say, we have a case actually we sued him. The case is going on, I don't know where. Please stand in solidarity, always attend some of the stations. I don't know when, but if you Google, smart sued it, the case is going on. The final thing I would like to say here, with all the support of beautiful people, all of you, we need more support morally, technically, and of course, financially. <laughs> I only understand one word is the dollar. We need money to build our institutions. We need money to create employment for people who cannot get jobs. Kindly, that's one message, donate in any way you can. Thank you very much. One more huge round of applause for our brave panelists. San Diego Diplomacy Council. 
We are beyond honored to be co-hosting this event for the third year, like Benny said, um, in a row. We're really proud. While we bring over 500 international visitors through the Department of State to San Diego each year, it is our work in the LGBT community that has been the source of some of our proudest accomplishments, especially in the last few years. Thank you to our many strong community partners, many of whom are here tonight, um, who meet with our international visitors and share this community's triumphs and challenges. We are particularly grateful to our co-host tonight, San Diego Pride and the LGBT Center for their incredible support. <laughs> their incredible support in giving our global friends a stage to share their experiences. I thank you also to the Department of State for your support of this type of programming. I speak on behalf of my team when I say that we are proud to stand as allies and we are committed to continue advocating for the promotion and protection of human and civil rights for the LGBT community on a global scale. And in anticipation of this event, um, actually a former IVLP visitor that sat right here two years ago, her name is Fernanda Garza, and she is from Mexico. Um, she wrote this to all of you on this program. <coughs> this is one of the greatest opportunities you will ever have in your life. You were chosen to be on this program because you are the best of the best. After this, your lives will change, and it is your duty to inspire as many people as you can in the world. Represent and be as proud as you can of your country, because you are shaping the world. Abrams, Chair of the International Affairs Board, to present uh, friendship certificates from the city's um, mayor called Kevin Falker. Good evening. I'm sorry the mayor couldn't be here in the city council, so wishes to congratulate you all for participating and for coming to San Diego and enjoying your time and learning about the LGBT community. Um, on me, as an openly gay person who serves as Chair of the International Affairs Board, it's even more thrilling to have these young individuals here. Um, I'm going to pass on the certificate of friendship for Natalie to read because you've had a long evening already. The certificate of friendship is hereby presented to, and it has each one of your names, by the mayor on behalf of the people of the city of San Diego with warmest wishes and hopes that the peoples of our two countries will grow in friendship and understanding. Thank you all for attending tonight, and I would like to leave you with this thought. Many of you came here today with curiosity, wonder, and desire to support our LGBT siblings around the globe. We know all too well that this nation is really good at exporting hate, and we need to work to ensure we export love and support. U.S. government agencies do not act unless the laws, policies, or executive actions tell them to. So, if you truly care about the successes of lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, intersex, questioning, asexual, transgender, oh, I said that again, and gender non-conforming lives around the world, yes, connect with these people today. Volunteer and donate. But the single most important thing I can ask you to do this year is to vote. Vote, 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 vote. vote. And make sure your friends go too. <laughs> so, at the end of the day, these nations from Cabo, I'm going to try it again, Cabo Verde, Democratic Republic of Congo, Cote d'Ivoire, Ghana, Guyana, Haiti, India, Italy, Kazakhstan, Mexico, Mozambique, Nepal, Niger, Palestinian territories, Poland, Republic of Korea, Rwanda, Slovakia, and South Korea, Taiwan, United Republic of Tanzania, Turkey, and Uganda. <laughs> we'll know that they don't just have our support, but they have the support of our nation. And so now I will leave you to mix and mingle because if a riot at a bar 
can spark a revolution in a party, then maybe you mixing and mingling tonight can change the world. Thank you so much, and good night.